We stopped at chapter 18 of the Tripurahasya and after a very interesting round of questions and discussions, we came to the point where Dattatreya says to Parshurama, knowledge of the Absolute is possible only through an inward and one-pointed mind. There is no other means. I will read the first couple of verses. Dattatreya said, Parshurama, I explained the nature of pure consciousness, which cannot ordinarily be known. And also, I explained the state of Samadhi, which one experiences on different occasions in daily life. The people deluded by Maya do not notice these moments. Knowledge of the Absolute is possible only through an inward and one-pointed mind. There is no other means. It is very clear from this comment that we experience samadhi or moments of these in daily life, as this text says. And when we experience this in daily life, why is it that we do not remember? The reason for this is these kind of temporary or as they're called fleeting samadhis are very mild they're not intense in character or nature and therefore one tends to forget the veil falls the veil of ignorance maya avidya that veil falls and so we forget but if the experience were strong enough intense enough we would not forget so we see that this experience, which would be in our normal daily life, the experience simply of having some kind of um, hmm, my pen does not work. Happened the last time as well. This is where we want to be, the center of consciousness, but most of the time we are focused at the level of body here. That's where we are. And we identify with this all the time. And this is where we remain at the body level. But every now and then we have some glimpses. We have some glimpses and these glimpses are forgotten. The only way we can remember them and be established, remain established in your consciousness is when we have Acquired a one pointed mind. What is a one pointed mind? A one pointed mind is not somebody who is with, with force and violence trying to concentrate on a certain object, on an external object, or even internal object. A one pointed mind is when these three aspects of the four aspects of the mind would be. Manas, Ankara, and Chitta are well coordinated. Manas is that part which coordinates the cognitive and active senses. Buddhi is your inner wisdom, it decides, judges, and discriminates. Ankara is that sense of identity that feels pain on separation from the whole. And chitta is the memory bank, which stores impressions and experiences. So we see these four are the four aspects of the mind. And if this were a wheel, 
but all these four spokes of the wheel are going in different directions or they are become independent and have totally different ideas of where to go, then obviously such a wheel will not move forward. The wheel will move in one direction only when all the four are coordinated and working together, just like the fingers on your hand. When the fingers of your hand all work together, they're very powerful. You know you can do a lot with your hands. But if your fingers do not work, or even if one of your fingers does not work, then it's very difficult. So all these four aspects have to be coordinated, working in the same direction, which means in practical daily life that manas should be coordinating the senses, both active as well as cognitive senses, and following the guidance of buddhi, your inner wisdom. Most of the times, manas is distracted and goes into the external world. And it gets itself into trouble. It gets so distracted that even though there's a little voice of wisdom telling him, don't spend your time on this, you need to be more focused, still these attractions take us away. One of my favorite examples is that of a student. If you want to study and you want to do really well, but there are many attractions in the external world, such as parties, then obviously the student is not able to focus on his studies. Such a student is obviously not going to do well. What about Ahankara? Ahankara is that sense of identity that separates you, separates you from others outside, separates you from even from your friends and family. It gives you your sense of identity. And while it is useful and gives you a sense of identity so that you can communicate and interact with the rest of the world, it also limits you. And Chitta is the memory bank, stores experiences and impressions. Some of these impressions are actually not very pleasant. They're painful. And these impressions also drag you down sometimes. The pain, the suffering that you may have experienced, the hurt, the fears, all these also disturb you. So if these four are not on track, you cannot have a one-pointed mind. And without a one-pointed mind, you cannot develop further. So says Parshurama, sorry, Tathathaya, to Parshurama. So you need an inward and one-pointed mind. So the mind, an inward mind, is the mind that is seeking to go towards the center of consciousness. And it is not moving outward. So if such a mind is moving inward, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make my pen work here, but it doesn't seem to want to work today. Mm -hmm. Last attempt at this. No. It works a little bit in between, but well, this one perhaps. No. No. It doesn't want to work today. All right. So then. It's a pity.
it only works in spots. But when I try to move the pen, it does not work. Okay. It's unfortunate. So this was the basic discussion, which says in the first paragraphs, you need an inward and one-pointed mind. Everything that we do in our tradition as a way of practice is to prepare for that. And if you are well prepared, then you are able to acquire a one-pointed mind. And attain self-realization. If you are not prepared well, you cannot attain a one-pointed mind and you cannot attain self-realization. So Dattatreya says, Parshurama, what good is this lengthy discussion? I will give you the essence. Through the mind, you can see the objects of the world. For the mind is an object itself. Mind continues to exist even when there are no objects for it to contact. Pure mind without an object is pure knowledge. Pure knowledge is eternally illuminated. In obtaining such knowledge, we cannot depend on any other object because such objects will also be dependent on other objects. Then, in the absence of the self-illuminated course, there will be darkness everywhere. O oh, son of Bhrigu, do you not experience yourself at the same time that you experience other objects? If you do not, then you yourself do not exist. Then how? How will you question and whom? So the gist of this was essentially that the mind exists even when there are no objects. So we can see from our diagram, which today I am not able to use <laughs> really well, that the mind, which is here, maybe I can use my spotlight at least so you can see something. This is the conscious mind here and the body and this is the external world. But most of the times we are in the external world, outwards oriented. We are not aware even sometimes of our body is so externally oriented, but it, generally we are aware of our body as well. But we are not aware so much of our thoughts. The fact is that even if we are not aware of the external world, like when you close your eyes, you may sit quietly, you know that you are there. And even if you'd be a little bit aware when you are in the external world, you know you are there. There is somebody, something that is experiencing this external world. And that's the key. Who is this? Who is experiencing this external world? If you do not exist any more than a flower in the sky, then why do you want to know yourself? How can I prove the existence of yourself to you? You have general knowledge regarding your existence, but you do not know yourself in reality. Your essential nature is indestructible. One whose doubts are completely removed realizes his true self. I wonder, having known the self, why are you deluded? That knowledge which illuminates all is pure knowledge. 
You cannot exclude. You cannot be excluded because you yourself are illuminated. You identify yourself with the body because body consciousness makes you think that way. Think subtly. When you experience something other than your body, do you also experience your body at the same time? In that case, everything related to you could be considered to be your body. Whatever you determine to be and identify yourself with, that you are. In this way, you will become one with everything. Then how can you be body alone? But you cannot be the objects of your experience because all these objects are continually changing. Therefore, your true nature is knowledge and not the transient non objects of knowledge. So the logic goes as follows in these verses that if you identify with something, if you focus your mind on something, you begin to identify with that object and whatever you identify with that you are. So what happens if you try to identify with External objects. You can identify with ex external objects, but these are changing. And so that cannot be your true nature, because your true nature is always eternal, permanent, indestructible. It is not transient. So focusing on the external objects you may experience something and that experience will lead you to that part in you which is constant. Because that constant is the ground. And it is only when you are focused on that constant part that you are able to see everything that's changing. If you did not have something constant in you, Everything would be changing. There would be nobody to question, who am I? Who is the knower? Who is the observer? There would be nobody to question that because everything would be changing. So whatever it is that we are experiencing that's changing in the external world, we can only do so because there's something constant and that's our frame of reference. It's from this point that we see everything around us moving and changing. Verse, fif verse 15 says, That knowledge, identical with the self, is ever illuminated. It is never contaminated by the particular objects which it illuminates. That radiant knowledge is stamped with the diverse impressions of the body, time, place, and so on. That which remains after removing all thoughts and desires is consciousness, or Atman, your true self. Ignorance, the root cause of birth and death, vanishes forever after one catches a glimpse of that self-existent reality. So, this verse actually is the essence here, after we have removed all thoughts and desires, what is left? Consciousness is left. If we go back to our nice image, we see that very clearly that this is the conscious mind. Ah, it works again. This is the body, this is the external world, and all these three are moving. So is, of course, the breath. All the impressions in the active and latent mind also will change. So the only thing that remains unchanging is pure consciousness. This is the unchanging. So if everything we negate everything that's, that's changing. We say, not this, not the senses, not, not the external world, not this, not the body. 
You're not the breath, not this, not this. Neti, neti, not conscious mind, because that is changing all the time. You're changing your thoughts about yourself, your identity about who you are. When you were a child, you said, I'm a child. When you were a teenager, you said, I'm grown up. <laughs> when you were grown up, you say, oh, I'm young. <laughs> and when you're old person, you know, you say, I'm wise. And your identity keeps changing. And it can be even funny. That when we're children, we want to be grown up, and when we're grown up, we want to be young. And so we have a kind of a conflict with our self identities. And this conscious mind is another word for hankara. Hankara has been given a bad name. The word ego in English also is used in a very negative way. The word ahamkara comes from aham which means I, kara means maker, so the I maker. It's, it's not bad. It's neither good nor bad. It simply is your identity. And the identity is useful in which it helps you to communicate with the external world. But as you can see here, it limits you. It limits you to only this part of the mind. Everything else has been blocked out. and. That's why you're not just that, you're more than that. So you're not also only active mind. If you would live in a world of dreams all the time, you would no longer identify with the body, with the conscious mind, with the world outside, then I would say that, that is death. Because if you're only dreaming, you spend the whole day dreaming, you're not aware of your body anymore or the external world, and that is death, right? Same with latent mind. It's the same thing, only you are identified there at that level, and you know there's still something beyond because even the latent unconscious mind will change. These are the seeds, these are the seeds out of which the rest of the mind and body grows out, emerges out of that. So even that is changing. Now all this, when we say not this, not this, neti, 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 neti to everything, what are you left with? You're left with center of consciousness, pure consciousness. This light here, this is like our inner sun here. This is what you are. So, any questions about that so far? I mentioned at the beginning of the session, and some of you had still not joined in, that I really enjoyed our last session when we had active discussion. So thank you to those who participated in that last session. Questions are most welcome. And um, I do enjoy these kind of discussions. So please don't hesitate if you have any comments or any doubts that you have. Okay, so that seems to be clear. And let's go back to our text. <clears throat> so we summarized that that which remains after removing thoughts and desires is consciousness or Atman, your true self. So ignorance, the root cause of death and birth, vanishes forever after one catches a glimpse of that self-existent reality. To Just to clarify this, 
to catch a glimpse of that self-existent reality. It has mentioned earlier in this text, as well as in the beginning of this chapter, that you may get such glimpses, fleeting samadhis, many times, but these will not enlighten you. And now it says that ignorance will vanish forever. It really depends on the intensity of those fleeting samadhis. If that momentary samadhi is so intense that it changes radically the way you look at the world, your world turns upside down. The things you thought were pleasurable before suddenly appear as painful to you. Then you know that that experience, that fleeting samadhi, definitely had an impact. And once you've had this taste of this nectar, and you long for it, you will do everything to work towards it. What happens is that you would start working to, towards this all the time. You would work to move inward. You would work continuously inward. Whether it is in a conscious manner or an unconscious manner, if you've had such a strong experience that shakes you up so radically that, you know, turns everything upside down in your life, you will start withdrawing from external objects. It doesn't mean that you are averse to them. It doesn't mean you start hating the external world. That's not what we are saying. The external world is not a bad place. It is a place for us to live out some of our samskaras and desires. So we are in no way getting into um, a fatalistic approach nor a negative approach to the world. But you do begin to realize that true happiness will not come from external objects. And as you work inwards, you will find over a period of time that it's useful to look after the body, you take care of it, like a temple, and you keep it clean, you, you learn to take care of your mind, not give it too many negative impressions. Keep good company is one of them. The idea of satsang is not only to listen to your teachers, to um, keep the company of good people, well, not to keep the company of suspicious characters. <laughs> what I mean by that is that if you keep the company of thieves, sooner or later, the police is going to come knocking at your door, even though you may have not stolen anything. So keeping bad company, unpleasant company, um, people with um, wrong values will have a negative impact on the conscious mind as well as unconscious mind. So this is the right-hand path we are talking about now. You want to see this division here of the mortal self is also called the right-hand path here when you're working on this level. You're working on the level of senses, body, breath, and conscious mind. When you start working at the level of active and latent unconscious, this is called the left-hand path. Now you're starting to work really with the samskaras themselves. And this is the more advanced path. This is the path where we say natatavyam, natatavyam, natatavyam. Means do not impart, do not impart, do not impart. These are the teachings that are not given very easily. And the student is tested is trained first, prepared, and then when he is ready, he is given the next step and help to work with the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is not 
something to be messed around with, there are real dangers there as well. Those who are overconfident and try to plunge into the active and latent unconscious mind will suffer deeply. But when you're trained well, when you have good guidance, you have somebody who supports you, who has done this journey before, it makes it much easier to go through this very, very difficult part of purification, which happens here, the left-hand path. Any questions regarding this? Any doubts? Anything you want to share? Radhika Ji, this is a very clear explanation of some ideas I've heard of before. Yes. I've heard of it doing the left hand path. So this is uh, now I understand what the left hand path is. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you, Radhika. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get that. Who was that? Hello. 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 Okay. Um, thank you very much. We always wondered what was the right path and the left one. So yes. This kind of clarifies. Yes, yes. This is the explanation. What has happened, unfortunately, is that uh, there have been a lot of misunderstandings and there are some very confusing ideas about the right-hand path and the left-hand path. And very often the left-hand path has been given an extremely bad name. Uh, and people talk about, uh, you know, it being more a path of um, indulging in, in sexual activities or... Uh, in meat and you know the, there are four m's they are called the four m's the m's are meat though it doesn't always work in in english but uh, there's fish there's maithun which is sex and then there is uh, mudra which means also grain and so eating certain grains is also considered to be a part of this path. Now, all these aspects of indulgence uh, is happening in some traditions, which are more external oriented. But in the internal tradition, this is how one would explain the right hand and left hand path. The right hand path is about living in the world, purifying oneself, organizing one's life, and you may do a lot of techniques, you know, you can do mm -hmm. asanas, breathing practices, and these will help at some level, but they are not pulling out the roots from here. Here, these are the roots of the samskaras, especially in the latent unconscious mind. And unless you pull out these roots, you cannot really progress or develop. This progress is accelerated manifold when you begin to work at this level of the unconscious mind. If you do not work at the level of the unconscious mind and your practices, techniques are only related to this part, this is the foundational aspect. This is where we say, organize your life, organize your values, the people you hang out with, you know, the company you keep, basically, your diet. All these are extremely important part, part of the development. This is the foundation. And without that foundation, you cannot move to the left-hand path or the internal path, really, as an internal, as a really working with the roots, the root of the problem. So Radhika ji, in other words, uh, the right hand path should be purified first. 
yes. in order to the left hand, right? Yes, yes. So the right hand path is the foundation, and the left hand path is uh, the higher stage or the higher level, the next level. And so, in our tradition, we would say, don't impart, don't impart, don't impart until you have not purified yourself, until you have not created the right atmosphere you cannot move on to the next step because that will not help you. It is like saying a farmer is, I've used this example with reference to mantra, so in the last session, that if a farmer just scatters the seeds without plowing his field, he's not prepared his field, what shall happen with the seeds? They will be just blown away in the wind. They will not germinate. They will not hold the roots in the ground. You know, so it's just a waste of effort and time. You first need to prepare the field, right? So that's important. Okay. Is uh, pranayama still part of the right hand path, or it's moving on to the left hand path? Um, in the breathing exercises that we talk about there is with this part over here and pranayama itself as i've often said is an internal aspect it works with the, at the level of energy and so if one follows those practices you will be going inward coming here to adi prana which is basically very close to the center of consciousness itself yes uh, Radhika ji, one more question. Um, this is regarding the traditions that we, certain traditions that is followed. Uh, this is Kala Tantra, Mishra, and yeah. Samana, which we yeah. have, have, right? Yes. Okay. The, uh, yeah. Uh, do we need to, does one need to go through all of them, or is it, uh, do we have to first follow Kala, then Mishra tradition? And then Samna, or we, how does it go? I wouldn't say one has to. It really depends on the person. So, um, Nilifa, could you please mute because we're getting background noise from you? So, it's not a have to. It really depends on the person and the level of development of that person. Some people, when they come to the teacher and present themselves, I have found them to be astonishingly mature, even though they're very young of age. On the other hand, I have encountered students who are much older, but are very immature, even though they have gone through life and have had many experiences. But in terms of their development, they are then at this level here, pretty much on the external level, these students need to be guided systematically. So a teacher of, a, of Samaya tradition, of our tradition, which is the internal tradition, a good teacher is able to guide such a student and take the student right from the beginning to the end of the journey. It does not necessarily mean that such a student is given external practices. Kala has, again, there are simplified versions of explaining Kala, Mishra, and Samaya. The simplified version is Kala are only external practices, Samaya are only internal practices, and Mishra are mixed, a little bit internal, a little bit external. Another version, another way of explaining this is that we go through these stages in our journey and this is the journey as i explained it's shown you here in this arrow here it's going inward right and a teacher who is very experienced has done the journey is able to take a student from wherever he is a teacher will recognize at which level the student is and then is able to take the student from if he is at this level of external, can take him gradually towards the internal. It's not always possible 
for such a student, maybe in one lifetime, to make that development. It is a very difficult process. But if a student comes who has, through his own experiences and maturity, gone through a certain development and has come to the conclusion, I'm not the body. He has begun to realize there's something more. He says, yes, yes, I understand there is something like the mind and I'm struggling with my own mind. Such a student is already a little bit developed, right? He's, he's realizing, hey, I, I, I know I'm not getting happy. I have a car, I, I have a, a spouse, I have kids and I'm somehow still not happy. Something is the problem and I see that that's something to do with the mind. Such a student is easier than to take to the next level. So you see, it depends on the level of the student. And a good teacher recognizes the level of the student and gives you the right practices and helps you to overcome your limitations. In practical purposes, for practical purposes, what this means is if a student is stuck only at external level, for example, rituals, gods, goddesses, or whatever, and um, comes to you and says, you know, I want to study with you, then I would say, hey, you know, this is going to be tough, but you're going to have to learn to give up a lot of things, a lot of fixed ideas. And that's hard for such a student, but certain students are able to do that. They, they, they have somewhere an intuitive knowledge, somewhere an intuition which says, yes, I know I'm struggling, but I can do it. On the other hand, there will be students who say, this is, they get angry. They will get angry and say, no, uh, this is, how can you, you know, say that there's something greater inside? And if I worship a deity, that, that should be good enough. So, yeah, the, the reality is <laughs> much more complex than the simple idea of Kala, Mishra, and Samaya. Okay. Thank you, Rat. Um, maybe in a place like India, where every corner there's a temple, mm -hmm. we do have very strong, certain beliefs as for the region that you come from mm -hmm. probably you know worshiping so many gods and goddesses mm -hmm. it could be tough <laughs> yes but it's not just about gods and goddesses it could be anything external now for example the modern idea which is very predominant among educated people not only in india but also in other parts of the world is atheism where they do not believe in anything and that can also be um, another fixed idea, which that's true. Yes, yes. Or science; those who are very scientific minded, they want to have scientific explanations for everything. And then, I, if I would say yes, do some asanas, do breathing practices, then they will ask me, and this has happened very often: uh, What is the proof that these breathing exercises? Uh, help is there any scientific study can you quote and while there have been biofeedback studies and medical studies have been done i am frankly not very interested in going through those studies and quoting from them i personally feel that the best study is self-study do these practices you your own laboratory you are the scientist observe yourself and see you will find that if you do diaphragmatic breathing long enough, you will see the big difference it will make in the quality of your life. You don't need any studies to prove anything. So those people who talk about science, for example, are also at this level external senses because modern science is related to the external world. They are at the level of body. And so they have a hard time understanding things related to the mind. They have a hard time understanding the connection. 
there is more work being done in connecting body and mind, but that generally remains at the level of conscious mind. This aspect of the unconscious mind has remained uncharted territory. It's true psychologists have done some work on it, but that has also been through an external person. So you have a psychotherapist, you have a psychologist who is like your counselor, but you do not learn really to become independent and to explore this yourself. You do not learn these, you do not have the tools for that in psychology and in this modern approach to the unconscious mind. They have archetypes and they have labeled, there are a lot of complexes and, you know, syndromes and, and things like that. And so they label certain behavior patterns which come from the unconscious mind. But it's very difficult for them to release these. And that can be done through deeper meditation. So simple meditation is basically that which would be done at the level of conscious mind. But deeper meditation, that is very rare. Very few people are able to do that. And that takes place at this level of active and latent unconscious mind, becoming aware of these. Thank you. Hi Radhika, Vijay here. You have a question? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, for uh, reaching the unconscious mind, uh, so what you said was um, there should not be a big set of ideas. Yeah? Uh, so, you know, we mean uh, we not believe on a big set of ideas, rather, we have to believe on our self study, yeah? study and learn from ourselves. So that is what, uh, am I right? Uh, so do, not do we have a exactly. set of ideas? Not exactly, Vijaya, not exactly. Um, mm -hmm. okay. When I, I say self-study, it means um, there is a systematic method. So for that, you need to have a an approach that you've been guided in by somebody who, who explains what the systematic approach is. It doesn't mean um, now I'm dropping all fixed ideas and I'm going to just do self-study. I, I wouldn't even know how anybody can begin that. For that itself, you need certain a system. You need some guidance. It, it cannot happen overnight that you just drop fixed ideas, whatever that means. When I say Fixed ideas here, I'm talking to Id about identities that you have. So you have an identity, I am a woman. And related to that, related to your gender, there's a whole lot of ideas that go with it. Even this aspect of fixed ideas and self-study is not a beginner's practice. For beginners, the right-hand path is very clear, marked with change of diet, having a satric diet, taking care of the body, using techniques like asanas, stretching, having exercise, whether it is going for walks or whatever other form of exercise. It includes having um, a regular lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, you know, organizing your day in a manner that is really um, giving you uh, anchors through the day, you know, so that you, you're not overcome with stress and disease, keeping the body healthy. So these are the aspects of the right-hand path that one needs to work with before you can start even thinking about working with the conscious mind, that is ahankara. Fixed ideas is ahankara. And that's 
very difficult. For that, you need guidance. I do not know really anybody who has been able to do that entirely on his or her own. Yes, there have been a few rare souls that has happened. And, but these are rare souls. But for most of us, we need to work first with the right hand path before we can move on to working with the mind, which means identities and going deeper into exploring the unconscious mind, which is nadatavyam, nadatavyam, nadatavyam. That is, do not impart. This has to happen, can only happen with guidance. Thanks, Radhika. So, verse 18 says, Liberation is found neither above the sky nor below it, nor on the surface of the earth. Renunciation of Sankalpa is the cause of liberation. Moksha is self-realization. That is why it is ever-present. Only through non-attachment can one attain liberation. So this is a very important line again here. Only through non-attachment can one attain liberation. The beginning of this chapter, Dattatraya tells Parshurana can attain liberation only through one means and that's a one-pointed mind. And now he says, oh, non-attachment is the only means to liberation. Well, these are not contradictory statements. Non-attachment, if we go to our diagram, means this aspect of Hankara, which has fixed identities, needs to expand, need to be more open to other ideas, thoughts, emotions, feelings, desires, fears, which are hidden, buried in the unconscious mind. And as you get more open, the actually it expands. So we're not talking about really destroying it, but expanding it. And as you keep expanding it, eventually it expands to include this. And when that happens, basically, Liberation is the attainment. Now you must understand, coming back to the question that was asked by Vijaya, you can see that this is an advanced meditation. Working with Ahankara is not something that everybody can do. Working with Ahankara means death. Uh, dying every day. It means these small self-identities will keep dying. It means facing death day after day after day. And this may take a long time. And that is why instruction is first work at the level of training the senses, manas, Taking care of your body, having a healthy body, calming your breath, having a good diaphragmatic breathing, learning breathing practices, and doing simple meditation. Being, beginning with simple meditation means simply learning to observe the breath. And that's it. When you have done that, then these deeper thoughts come. Then something pops up. When you have some fleeting glimpses which of the center of consciousness which just come through suddenly a flash and when you ask deeper questions then you will find a guide your teacher will guide you how to do this part because this is the left hand path is the path that has and not without reason been kept very very um Secret is the word. I don't like to use it. It sounds 
somehow keeping the others out. But the fact is that this is not a path which is not dangerous. It is, there are dangers. There are dangers in the left-hand path when you are beginning to work with the con unconscious mind. Okay, so I think this is a good place to stop at this point here where we stopped at the end of this page before we go to the next page. Moksha is self-realization, that which is ever present. So you saw, I explained the diagram, it expands into self-awareness of, of, of Atma or pure consciousness, and that limited identity of the conscious mind expanded. And that is what is called ultimately moksha, self-realization. Okay, if there are no more thoughts or comments, then we can stop here. We will continue next time thank you very much everybody bye bye thank you bye bye thank you thank you bye 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 shibu bye daddy bye bye everybody bye 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 bye